everything, man. Amazing. <laughs> so guys, what we do every week, we read the Word of God out loud together. Okay, this is the most powerful part of our time. This is God's Word. When you open the Bible, you're getting a text from God. So let's read verses 31 through 37. We're in our journey through Mark in Mark chapter 7. All right, verses 31 through 37. Here we go, starting at verse 31. Again, everybody, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the midst of the region of the Catholics to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought him one who was dead and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking out to heaven, he sighed and said to him, That is, be open. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke readily. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. So, what's worse? To be deaf or to be blind? Yeah. Okay? I mean, question no one really wants to answer, right? And I've, I've, what I've studied and seen that doctors have corroborated on is that people would rather be blind than deaf because of the number of sensors that come in the ear and because of the feeling of being cut off from the world if you have no hearing. And so we're going to get in, we're going to go into the world of a man who could not hear and a man who could not speak. And we're going to find out what was going on in his life and we're going to see how Jesus Christ identified with and communicated with this man in Mark chapter 7. This miracle we're going to read about today and study it's only found in one place in the whole Bible. It's only found in Mark's Gospel. The feeding of the 5,000, all four Gospels. Resurrection, all four Gospels. Other events in Christ's life that were seismic, important, crucifixion, other things, all four Gospels. This miracle is only in Mark's Gospel. So to get us in the context, kind of what's going on in here, guys, this is the question of the... Um, First question here. What was Jesus doing in Gentile lands? Now, Caleb covered this a little bit last week. Why was He up there outside of Israel? Some scholars believe He was as long as eight months. He's kind of getting toward the end of His ministry. He's two years into His earthly ministry. And some estimate He spent as many as eight months in this region. Departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, Last week we talked about how he healed the Syrophoenician woman, this Gentile woman who the Jews referred to as dogs, whose, whose daughter was demon-possessed. Remarkable miracle. Jesus just spoke. He said, go home, your daughter, the demon's gone. And he set her free. Now, what, now how did she know about Jesus? And why would she come to him to have her demon-possessed daughter healed? Who remembers? <clears throat> One other time Jesus went to these, these parts, very briefly, and they asked him to leave. You remember that time, Ralph, in Mark chapter 5? I do. But I, I, Bella had 40 de uh, 1,000 demons in him, a legion of demons. Right. I, I just, uh, there was something that uh, uh, Hoover said, Jeff Hoover said a couple of weeks ago, we weren't here, we missed it. Yeah. Uh, but we were talking about how Jesus went to different aspects of the kingdom to show his supremacy over the kingdom. So he walked on water because the Roman god Neptune, right, Neptune, uh, was the god, the yeah. god or goddess yeah. of, the, of the sea. So Tyre and Sidon, Harvey and I had the privilege of going there, uh, was 
was actually promised to Moses as being part of uh, Canaan, the, the new Canaan. Yeah. So the kingdom, even though the Romans had divided up yeah. Israel, it was Tyre and Sidon were part of the promise that God gave Moses as being the kingdom yeah. of Canaan. Right. And so Jesus goes there, he casts out a demon because Tyre and Sidon is a demonic stronghold. Yes, so just like he walked on the water, he went to the outer reaches of Canaan, his kingdom that has promised him coming in, you know, now, the new kingdom. So I think he went there to cast out demons to show that he had supremacy over demons, even in the outer reaches of Tyre and Sidon, because that was the promised land that was given to Moses and to, and to Israel and the future kingdom of Jesus when he returns. Very good, very good, Ralph. So how would they have known about Jesus up there? Well, good news spreads fast. Well, how did news spread? By hearing. Caleb. By hearing. Yes, by hearing, because Jesus was doing miracles, and it says expl explicitly earlier in Mark that people from Tyre and Sidon had gone to hear him and yeah. see the miracles he'd performed. Yeah, and so, but remember specifically, in chapter 5, a man has a legion of demons. How many is a legion? Thousands. That man was from this area. The only man that said that Jesus told not to follow him was the demoniac who he delivered. Remember? And what did he tell him to do, Ralph? He said, go tell everybody. And where was everybody? Everybody was in Tyre and Sidon. Who you just talked about. So they had heard, you know, so the one was th thinking, he cast out a thousand demons out of one man who came and told everybody, he changed, this guy was the terror of our country, well surely he can deliver my daughter. And so she came, and so now these two men in this area, this region, outside of Israel. By the way, another reason he went up here is because of the horrible uh, treatment that was coming to him from Israel and from, you know, ultimately Jerusalem where he would go back. And remember, they were trying to take him and make him king, right? So he got away from all that to a new area. And so he came to the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged. Look at the two brought. Everyone say brought. 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 That means they physically brought someone to Jesus. And then they beg, two B words. Everyone say beg. Hey. Hey. So these guys, whoever they are, maybe like the friends in chapter 2, were determined about bringing their friend to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. I thought about this. When's the last time I brought someone to Jesus? And by the way, what kind of friend am I if I'm not bringing you to Jesus? Who are your friends? You wrote down on that sheet of paper a list of all your friends who you would call a friend. And then if you went back and said, now how many of these people have I connected to Jesus? Now if you're really my friend, Hoover, are you, is he ever going to come up? Are we going to talk about the Lord? I know you want to talk about the ball game. Let's talk about the ball game. Roll tie, baby. I was just in Tuscaloosa. A lot of ball game down here. That stadium's unbelievable. This preacher down there told me, he said when he gives a good, powerful message, and he gives a real zinger, you know, from the pulpit, instead of saying amen, they say roll tie. <laughs> I'm serious. Over, go quick, man. We, we, we did the... Go, they, yeah. got, they got confused down there. They thought they were going to walk. They exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Well, I just wanted to say the thing is that when I was leaving uh, from last week, Jesus was in the Galilee and he went all the way across the tire. Uh, yeah. That's a long way. It's a haul. You yeah. know, to go all the way across. And uh, uh, he was just saying about. The thing is that Ralph was just saying about uh, demons that might have been over that sea, but I was just thinking also the Tyre and Sidon was an area of the Phoenicians. Yeah. And the Phoenicians were known as uh, 
both people, you know, they were traders right. that went all right. over the world at that particular time, yep. and also by going across and and uh, ministering in that one city for a little while, that that could be then spread across by mouth and by through the boats as yep. they went to trade. Yeah. All the way across yeah. because he didn't stay there. Then he yeah. went right back to the Galilee, yeah. you know, the capitalists is all around the Galilee area. They were a seafaring lot though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and by the way, the, it was the people in that area that tragically introduced Israel to Baal worship. They introduced Baal worship to Israel. So there's a lot of history, a lot of uh, acrimony, a lot of vitriol. You know, anger. The only time that they ever were kind to Israel was in the in the great peaceful days of of uh, building Solomon's temple. They provided wood, which was you know the cedars of Lebanon, right? You know, Glenn knows all about that. So we I don't want to linger there. That's good stuff. But, but, yeah. So southern Lebanon, you know, God had has really a soft spot in His heart for the cedars of Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, southern Lebanon is very important to the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And so, Kaleem's there right now. Yeah, we got to be praying for their right. team. Yeah, Jeff, we've been to Tyre. Yeah, you guys have been there it's with still them. a stronghold. It's yeah, it is. Stronghold. But God's working. There's some work happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in the, the Christian seminary that we supported in the Christian school and work with the refugees. Now uh, Syrians are flooding in there. So here's what they brought him to Jesus. They begged Jesus to put his hand on him. So I just, I just love that. They brought and they begged right there. That's a sign of a true friend. You can say you're a friend, but if you're not really introducing someone, and you may lose a friendship over Jesus. Anyone lost a friend because of that? There's people that don't want to talk to me right now because I bring him up. He is my best friend, and I want to introduce everyone to him. And even in a kind, gracious way, you know, people want to avoid that subject with you. But that's the sign. True friends introduce their friends to Jesus. In this case... This guy had could, didn't know what he was going. This guy was all messed up. He couldn't hear. He probably had to let, lead him by hand. And they begged Jesus to put his hand on him. They wanted the touch of the master's hand. Well, listen, it's one thing to have the touch of the master's hand. That sounds a lot better than the taste of the master's spit on the master's hand. And we're going to see one of the most remarkable miracles ever. Three times in the scriptures, Jesus uses spit, saliva, in a miracle. He does it here. We'll study it in a few weeks in chapter 8 of Mark. And then in John chapter 9 in the temple. And it creates a big uproar where he uses saliva. So we're going, to, we're going to see that here. This is remarkable. So what was wrong with this man? I put that question there. It was death. Had an impediment of speech, so he couldn't. He, so he, his, his 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 tongue was bound. He couldn't speak. He couldn't hear. Why is this such a bad disease? Why is this? What's so tough about this? Anybody? Everybody? Come on. Anybody familiar with the shame that would have been on this guy? This was before hearing aids. This was before the 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 implants you can get okay like the surgery that Rush Limbaugh had remember that brought his uh, hearing back it was common, before modern medicine before sign language was a big thing yeah common so, term back in my time was deaf and dumb yeah right dumb yeah I mean of course if you're deaf you, you can't pick up the words right all they can do is read try to read yeah. lips yeah what's so bad about this condition now think about the shame they would have thought. Someone that could not speak so associates that with someone who's ignorant. They're, they're, there's something wrong with them. And think about how long and the kind of things that were said of this man, the kind of shame, the kind of pain, you know, especially in a shame culture like this, okay? And so here, so here they bring him to Jesus. There was, a, there was a lot wrong with him physically, we can see here. But there was also a whole lot emotionally, probably, and spiritually wrong, too. Go ahead. Go check. One of the things that uh, we still see all around the world today is that certain physical uh, and intellectual disabilities are seen as a sign of God's 
is pleasure. Right? Yeah. So a lot of times cultures will reject and marginalize a person under the false belief that God has already rejected them. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I you guys know what I live with, uh, the, the challenges that we live with in our house. And one of the hardest things that we even have to do is to help the church, even the people of God, understand yeah. that my son is 100% <clears throat> completely human, intentionally made and loved by God. Yeah. So I can only imagine uh, what it must have been like for this man. No. Right. Very good point. You know, the, the superstition was huge back then, run by everything. And even, even in Jewish culture that believed in the one true God, a theistic culture, even those people thought, man, there's something, you, you know, you've sinned. You know, and they said it, remember in John, I believe it was John 9, who sinned? This man, right, or his parents, yeah. they didn't be born this way. Remember that? Yeah. They just assumed that. They just ascribed some kind of, you know, sin to you if you had a handicap. Well, think about in the pagan culture. Remember, who is Mark writing to? He's writing to Romans. He's writing to Gentiles. These are people that are, you know, that are very into punchy, active, show me. You know, we're going to see the word immediately here in a second. It's all throughout the book. You know, straightway he went. So it's an action book. He's writing to Gentiles. Man, if you thought the Jews were like that, the Gentiles even have more because the Gentiles served a whole polytheistic pantheon of gods, thousands of gods. So this guy, they probably thought, I mean, this guy got sideways with all these people, you know, and, and he's really, the demons are all over him, you know, the god of this and the god of that and everything. And so, so, he, so, so Jesus does seven things here. Okay? And the, I got seven S words. Man, I had to work to get seven S words. But I got it, okay? So if you're taking notes, jot these down. I can give it to you later, too. So the first S, here we go, is separated him. Look at verse 33. So what does Jesus do? He took him aside from the multitude. Jesus separated him from the crowd, from the clamor, the chaos of the crowd. <clears throat> Why is that important? <laughs> You got all these people. You got all this healing. Everyone wants to come and hear the master. It's crazy. It's crowded. And Jesus separates them. Why is it important to get one on one with Jesus? Hey, when we're in a crowd like this, it's easy to pose and put the mask on, isn't it? I'm better at it than anybody. But when you're one on one with the master, when it's just you and him, yeah. He took this guy, he took him away from that crowd. Powerful. I'm still wondering how he did it. But he's the boss, right? So he figured he found a way. So the first thing is he separated him. Got one-on-one -on -one with him. Okay? Imagine looking in the eyes of Jesus, just you and him. Now it's just you and him. And by the way, when you are with him... He is here with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. His word is right here. Amen. There's a powerful thing about getting one on one with Jesus. Do that first every day. Do that last every day. Do that all during the day as much as you can. That's why I gave you that mighty warrior. Powerful little New Testament. That changed my life. Junior year of high school. It's just me and that book and Jesus. And that you, that's the only book you can read. The book will start reading you. Okay? Amen. Powerful. That's why it's illegal in 35 countries. So, first S separated. Second S is stuck. He stuck his fingers in the guy's ear. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that right there? Look. What are you doing? He's got to get a picture. This don't happen much. Front page of the Wall Street Journal. He stuck his finger in his ear. Wow. Now, why do we stick our fingers in our ears? Well, you know, a lot of people do that when I come around. They don't want to hear me. <laughs> we get some wax. Uh, well, you know, we used to do a thing called a wet willy. What was that? Yeah, right. Remember that? <laughs> you lick it and you stick it. Yeah. You ever walk up behind you like, oh, man, you lick me, you know? He stuck his fingers in his ears. Now, why did he do that, guys? Dude, sometimes we have to do that to our kids because nothing stops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, they're wondering what's between my two ears sometimes, too. Hey, now think about this. Jesus has a way of putting his finger 
right on the problem. Amen. You think about that. Yeah. And you think about, now I'm, we're going to, I want to let him talk to you the way only he can. What issue, what's your pain? What's your challenge that he's wanting to put his finger on in your life? What is that problem that only he can touch? I mean, can you just picture that? The Lord of glory who created that man's ears and everything around is sticking his finger in the guy's ear. Amen. So that's the, that's the, so first he separates and second he's stuck. And then the third thing is he spat. That's good. Now, scholars don't think that Jesus was a big tobacco chewer. So he didn't chew necessarily. But we know he spat. And again, a whole, this is, I'm telling you, this is a super unique miracle. And I'm going to tell you why, too. I want to talk about this. But he spat. That's, a, that's, a, that's the best S of all of these. Because, you know, it, it's right there. He spat. And then he stroked. He spat lightly on his fingers. Okay, on the fingers of Jesus. His own fingers. He spat into his hand. And then he touched, he stroked the man's tongue. Now, I'm not going to do that. That's just cross the I know. Camera, okay. But he touched his saliva. Now, as far as I can read in the Bible, this is the only case in history recorded in Scripture where another person tasted the saliva of Jesus Christ. And just that thought, it's just counterintuitive. You just, you know, when does this happen? You know, you know, Psalms 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It gives a kind of new perspective. We know people ate the bread that he made. The 5,000 did. He's going to feed 4,000 more next week. Okay? We know people drank the water that he turned to wine. We know maybe they ate after him, after, you know, bread that he tore, the, he bit from the ate. But this is the only time the saliva of Jesus Christ, the living Lord, the living water, touched the mouth was tasted by another human being. Just the thought of that. So he, he stroked the man's tongue. With, now again, he's touching the pain right there, like the tongue. Think about how sensitive the tongue. Think about the number of bacteria the tongue. What, what do they say? You remember the grade school lecture, Harvey? They said, when the teacher said, now here's how you brush your teeth, the dentist says, brush your tongue as much as you brush your teeth. It's low to the bacteria. You know, what does James tell us about the tongue? It's a deadly weapon, it's right? That little serious. piece of flesh trapped behind that, you know, those, those, those bars of ivory can do a lot of destruction. Right? The, the same tongue that can bless you, bless you, man, God's favor upon you. It's the same tongue that can yell fire in a crowded theater and cause people to be trampled to death. So, but his tongue had never spoken. His tongue had never sung the praises of God. His tongue had never laughed. His tongue had never argued. His tongue had never spoken a crossword. And Jesus Christ in that moment, with his own spit in his own hand, touched this man's tongue. So that's the that's the um, that's the next S. He stroked his tongue. And look at this next one. Verse 34. Then looking up into heaven, he saw. It's an S word. He saw. Why did he look up into heaven? Why do you look up to heaven when he broke the bread to feed the 5,000 in chapter 6? Why did he do that? Remember? Right. To bless, to, to point to God. This is real important, gang. Yeah, that's right. God is heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. From where okay? all blessings flow. Yeah, from whom all blessings flow. That's right. Hoover, yeah. The thing is that I think he was looking up into heaven because the people... Uh, he wanted them to know where this power was coming from. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. He also, I think a lot of this uh, reminds me of a village that uh, we went to. There actually are still villages like this. Uh, this was had thousands of people, but basically it was only seven families. And so much intermarriage going on that 
there were handicapped, many, many handicapped in this mm -hmm. area. And really nobody went in because of the shame. And Jesus was loving this man. Yeah. He was he was doing things that the society, because of the shame, because of uh, not accepting him and all this, that he would never get in the society. Nobody would touch him. Nobody would right. uh, do this because they were afraid of yeah. him. But Jesus was saying it would show, and, and uh, even though it was privately, he was showing to him yeah. that he was loved. Yeah, that's that good. he could be touched. Yeah. That he could be, you know, that he really compassion. Uh, yeah, he, the compassion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Everyone say compassion. 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 This is a very fascinating thing. What this guy Guzik says, I like this guy. He's a uh, Calvary Chapel pastor. He said, "Many cared about this man, and perhaps many had prayed for his healing, but no one ever stuck their fingers in his ears or spit on his tongue like this." Jesus did something completely new to catch this man's attention, because he could not catch his man's attention with words. Through touch and the use of spittle, Jesus entered into the mental world of the man and gained his confidence. Now this is before the invention and the perfection of sign language. So if you're going to communicate with someone who can't hear your words, and you're going to communicate with someone who only has the sense of taste, and has the, 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 you know, the vision and touch, he went into his world. So to sense Christ is using a primitive form of sign language. I mean, he's going. Who knows more about his pain? This guy does his hearing. This guy's more acquainted with his hearing problem than anybody, right? Because he can't hear. So what does Jesus do? He touches him and he connects with him in a tactile way right here. See? And he can taste. And he knows that he can't speak. And something has bound his tongue up all these years. And what does Jesus do? He touches him there. And then, it's kind of neat, so now he's thinking, okay, now, how is this problem going to be solved? You've identified the ear. You've identified the, the, the speaking organ problem. How is it going to be solved? Next thing, he saw. Jesus looks up. The greatest solution is God Almighty. Right? And so Jesus looks up. He looked up into heaven. So this man is seeing Jesus look up. He said, okay, there's hope. So I look to the Lord, right? I called upon the Lord. I looked up, and he looked up. So, and so what happens? This is the next S. This is a kind of cool one. He said, it says, he sighed. Don't be lost on that. That same Greek word, for the word side there is the same word Paul uses in Romans 8.23 and 8.26 where Paul talks about the groanings of our human condition longing for God's coming longing for the ultimate healing so there's a pain in that moment in that sigh we have the Lord Jesus Christ his bowels of compassion for now right there just like Jeff here we have the pain. He was acquainted with our grief. He was a man of sorrows. Jesus Christ felt his pain in that moment when he sighed. And there's only one person who's ever walked this earth who can look you in the eye right now and say, I feel your pain. And his name is Jesus. <coughs> and guess what? He took that pain where? Cross. He took that pain to the cross. The pain of your sin and your shame and your screw-ups and everything and all the stuff you've done. And he took it to the cross and he bore in his body our sin on that cross on that tree. Amen, that brother. Animal. And Amen. he said, Father, forgive them. Well, they know and in effect, he says, put your wrath on me Amen. in Ralph's place, in Stu's place. You take his punishment, his whipping, his pain, his shame, and you put it on me. And God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. In him. Amen. See? Amen. So God put and killed his only son to make us sons. Isn't that beautiful? That's the great exchange. 
So in that moment, he sighed. And there's a sense of deep compassion and brokenness. He could have tears run down his eyes as he's touching this man and feeling the intense pain of soul. The burden this guy carried was far deeper than just the pain in his ears and not hearing and the, the limit in his speech and not being able to speak. And then look at this last one. He said he spoke. Final S. He spoke. Ephatha, which is tough to pronounce, but it's Aramaic for be open. Everyone say be open. Be open. Be open. Be open. It's a strong word. He is commanding his ears to be open. The one who commanded light. In Genesis 1-3, let there be light. The one who commanded creation is now creating sound. And now recreating this man's entire apparatus and anatomy of his eardrum all the way through, connecting to every sensor, the thousands of little tiny sensors, all the little molecular devices that are in there, right? The little things that are tentacles to the brain, to the sound, to communicate. All of a sudden, whammo, be open. Creation right there. In a new creation. So, so three things happen as a result here. These are the three things happen. Ready? First, first of all, everyone say immediately. 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 This is Mark's favorite word. It's everywhere. It's quick. It's moving. Immediately. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ speaks, when Jesus Christ shows up, it happens. Amen. Boom. Thank Everything you. changes. Everything happens. Now look at what three things happened to him. Immediately, first, his ears were open. Just like that. Boom. Second, the impediment of his tongue was loose. Third, he spoke plainly. Amen. Notice the order of those three things and the order of what Jesus did to this man. You know, touch his ears first, right? Spat, touch his, touch his mouth. His ears were open first. Second, his tongue was loosed. And then thirdly, he spoke plainly. So that was the that was the, the three responses. Verse 36. Then he commanded them. By the way, why is this miracle so remarkable? <coughs> Anybody, everybody? <laughs> Maybe the question might be, how is it not remarkable? Right? Go ahead, right back here. It's done immediately. Yeah. It does not happen immediately. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, right here. Good. Well, the main point was Jesus taught that this healing was unconditional. Yeah. It was traditional. It was predicated on their salvation and restoration. Yeah. Okay. So, an unconditional. Hey, I'm going to tell you what's fun about studying Scripture. You start studying. I want to go on this rabbit trail. You start studying other cultures. Let me tell you what's fascinating about this miracle. Did you know that the pagan culture, the Roman readers would have been jaw-dropping, blown away by this miracle. Mark's audience. And I'll tell you why. Because in their culture, you know what one of their highest kind of regarded forms of medicine was? Human saliva. And all their great dojos and spiritual godlike priests and others that would travel, these healers, right, these guys, a lot of it was sleight of hand, a lot of it could have been satanic stuff. But they would claim that their spit was better than the other guy's spit to bring healing. Seriously. There is a medicinal property connected to saliva and spit in antiquity, in ancient times, in the Greek and Roman culture. If he just begun to hear, how was he able to speak? He's never heard spoken words before. Yeah. Right. Another part of the miracle. Amen. Yeah. So you have all these people who have been contaminated by this, this false, polytheistic, synchronistic, false teaching of, you know, this your saliva, they've been probably ripped up. I wouldn't doubt it, and I don't want to go beyond Scripture, but I wouldn't doubt if these, these friends had taken him to all these would-be healers. And they did the spit thing. And none of it took, and everyone's a skeptic. And this guy, maybe he's bitter. It's like, man, this is a bunch of, you know... No one can help me, man. I've, I've, been, I've, I've had to spit into my system from all these other would-be healers. None of it worked. And it's like, it's almost as though Jesus Christ <clears throat> is saying, is rebuking all the false gods. It's as though only he can, only what he can do 
right? And it says it in this last verse. I love this. As we'll get there in the closing verse, but but real, pretty fascinating. The rebuke that is to all the other false systems, and nothing else could work. And like the woman who had the flood condition, that she, she the medical bills piled up, no doctors could fix her, but she came and just touched the hem of his garment, and she was immediately healed. Verse thirty-six. Then they command, he commanded them they should tell no one. It's such a remarkable miracle. And I almost didn't teach this passage because of that right there. You know, I didn't want to. Maybe we should have skipped it, Joel. What do you think? Yeah, I think he was <clears throat> using child psychology. Now here's what's great. Yeah. Now Ralph made a good point. The more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Why would Jesus tell them not to tell anybody? By the way, practically speaking, let's think about that real quick. No, it just stops. It was going to take yeah. place. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. Because the the guy, they would, people go see that guy at, like you go see a freak at a freak show. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. No power socks. This is not how you 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 know hail teens. Okay, teenagers. Tell them not to do it, and then they go do it. Right. The opposites. So the more he told them, the more they spread the word. Okay. So Christ again is coming to the end of his ministry. Christ came to whom first? Romans 1, 16. To the Jew first. Yeah. He came to the people of Israel. Okay, that was his primary target. Another big reason that, going back to the first question, it's very important. Another big reason Christ is going to these Gentile lands and healing and spreading the gospel is because it's a picture of what would happen. Remember, the disciples started where? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Acts 1, 8. You'll be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem. Then Judea. And Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The heat got turned up in Jerusalem, remember? This mean dude named Saul, who was a, a murderer, who turned into a missionary and ultimately became a martyr. But the gospel was confined, the, the heat turned up, the persecution increased on the Christians, intensified. Where'd they go? Outside. So Christ is giving a picture of what would happen in the Great Commission. It's a little picture, okay? So so he's going to them. And, <clears throat> but he is not, not yet. Everyone say not yet. Not, not, yet. not yet. So he's, he's not wanting to be popularized as a healer. Number one, he came to save souls. You can heal the body, but if the soul perishes, what good is it, right? So that's the first thing. Secondly, he did not want to have this huge following among Gentiles in Rome because he was going back to where? Very soon which is going to be in the latter half of our study of Mark, to Jerusalem. And he's going to talk about it next week, or in the next couple weeks, when he's going to go back to die. So so that's that's the big reason why he's told him not to spread and why they became it. Verse 37, look at this verse. I love this verse. Guys, memorize this verse. And they were astonished beyond measure. They were astonished beyond measure. Saying... He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So everyone say these words. He has done all things well. Say that with me. He has done all things well. That can only be said of one person that's ever walked this planet. The first Adam blew it, sin in the garden. The second Adam, from the womb, the virgin birth, all the way to the empty tomb. He did all things well. He's the only one that ever lived that never blew his assignment. He's the only one that ever lived that ever kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. He lived a perfect life that I could not live. He did all things well. He died a perfect death as the spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice, in my place. He lived well. He died well. He conquered death and rose again the third day. Amen. He did all things well. So that's the kind of Savior we serve. Everybody stand up. We're going to close in prayer. I just want to challenge you. I'll get Phil Cox to come up and close this. Phil, come close in prayer while you're on your way up here. These final two questions, guys, these are a couple real zingers here. And I want you to really take these questions with you. I want you to really ponder them. Um, I love what this guy, one guy said, he said, he said, 
Um, how has Jesus Christ said, be open to us? How are our ears open to listen to the Word of God? How have our tongues been loosed to sing praise and prayer to Him? So you have this, uh, I've always wondered kind of, what would you think the, the first thing he ever heard was what? This dude. He heard Jesus Christ. Word. First words that entered his ears were the words of Jesus Christ saying, Be open. I wonder what the first thing he ever said was. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Hey, think about this. You really think he cared if he sang off off tone at church? <laughs> you really think he cared if he could mispronounce something? You think about what came out of this man's mouth. Everything from that moment in this man's life was different. So look at these last two questions, guys. Now really lean into these questions, okay? How has Jesus opened your ears and changed your speech? How is your speech different today because of Jesus Christ? What you say. By the way, if I followed you all around today and listened to you talk, and listen to how you talk, and listen to who you talk to, when I hear the transforming and see the transforming power of Jesus in that speech, yes. and what you listen to, be it the music, be it the whatever you listen to on the radio, be it the conversation you listen to, the jokes you abide and listen to, when I hear things that exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, so how has he changed your, you know, your uh, hearing? I love what this one guy said. We're reminded by this analogy that deafness is not just a physical condition. It's a spiritual one. And many of us can be, have deafening noise all around us and not hear the voice of God. And not hear what he wants to say to us. So, final question. Bill's going to pray. How has he astonished you beyond measure? I mean, these folks were blown away. So how has Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life just astonished you? When you just, this last time you just stepped back and were in awe of what Jesus Christ has done. And here's a more <coughs> convicting question. Who is astonished by what he's done in your life? Who says, man, that guy right there, what has the Lord done? Who's astonished and amazed by how Jesus Christ has changed your life? And see, that's what you are. If you're a believer, you're a spreader of amazement and astonishment. Right? Because you're bringing people like those friends to Jesus. And He touches your ears. He touches your tongue. He touches all every, every part of you. What, what Peter said in the upper room? He says, wash all of me, man. Wash me all. And that's the heart and that's the prayer. Go to Him and everything changes. So, Phil, come up and pray. There's a video out there. I'll, I'll send you if you want to see it. Where Pastor, Pastor Dwayne was preaching. And Pastor Dwayne was a powerful preacher and a pastor. And God took his voice. He lost his voice. He had a real struggle. And it was a burden. And the whole community had been praying for him for like a couple years. And he couldn't get it back. And... He was up trying to share his testimony, and it was painful to listen to because his voice is so raspy. And he's talking real kind of, real, real like, like gravel, listening to gravel, okay? And he's talking about how Christ doesn't always heal, but he always heals the way he wills, right? And he's always working in us, the deeper issue. Like Johnny Erickson taught her, she'll be in a wheelchair, and she praises God for that pulpit. She's led millions to Christ, and she's prayed for healing. She's had faith healers touch her all over the world, and she's never been healed of that, but she's been healed inside, and she's, God's used her to bring healing to others. So while this guy is preaching in the middle of his sermon, Pastor Dwayne, his voice starts to get stronger. And all of a sudden, his voice is even more clear. And while he's preaching, God heals his voice. Amen. Amen. And there's a video of this. It is, it's, it, I, I was crying listening to it. And 
And he starts to weep openly in the pulpit. And he just starts to quote, bless the Lord, O my soul. Right there. So that's the power of our God. Yes. Right? And so let's just pray that God would take our voices and our hearing. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you got a voice today, use it to bring the word of God to someone. To introduce someone to the one who can touch them and transform their life. Forever. That's why Jumper and Speaks and Todd are in Texas preaching the gospel right now. That's why Chetwood's somewhere we can't even say where it's dangerous. That's why Kaleem and those guys are on the other side of the Middle East where everyone says, don't go there. Because people need Jesus. Because he will transform not just their body, but he'll heal their, heal their soul forever. So Phil, pray us out and pray for those guys. Come on up, baby. Lord, mm. thanks for being so good. Mm. Thanks for healing us. Thanks for touching our ears and our tongues. Mm. in our hearts and our minds. Thanks for the way that you have blessed us and provided for us. Thank you, Lord, for your work. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for Stu. Thank you, Lord, for this gathering and for the way you've used it to bless many, many people. And we've been grateful for this time together. We ask God that you just use us today for your glory mm. and for your, for your purpose and everything we do to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.